So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, uh, webinar about shared services. We're glad you could join us. We appreciate your taking your time to be with us uh, today. Um, on the webinar today, and part of the faculty, a uh, number of uh, uh, presenters that are uh, well qualified in their fields and and uh, uh, subject matter experts in some of the shared services that we plan to talk about. So. Uh, we've got Bill Collette, who is a, a, a volunteer. He's with the um, a board member with the Mount Diablo Council. He's on the Western Region Board. He's a member of the Area 3 Finance Impact Support Committee. And uh, Bill's going to be, uh, his, his strong suit is endowment. He'll be talking to us about BSAM today. Also on the line, we have Ken King, uh, part of the uh, national staff related to uh, BSAM. So he'll be uh, available for questions if you have any as well. And then we have uh, Steve Dowd. Uh, who is the uh, Vice President of, of Sales for Jacasa, our outsourced accounting department. Uh, we'll also expect to have Joe Danishevsky, Scout Executive of the California Inland Empire Council, joining us today. Uh, Joe is a, a terrific uh, believer in and supporter of shared services. He uses a number of the offerings that we'll talk about today, and, and uh, we want to give you a uh, his perspective uh, from a local council scout executive perspective of, of, of why this is important and, and, how, and uh, how it's working for them. So the goal of uh, using shared services uh, are a number of positive things that can happen when a council uses shared services. Number one, it, it puts subject matter experts in the back office of the council through an outsourced model so that the council staff can, can uh, focus on the core competencies of membership growth and program growth and and customer service, and so it uh, basically when, I, when people ask, well, you know, what, what do I get with a shared service? What you're paying for is peace of mind, and uh, you, you have highly competent professionals uh, working on your behalf in the council on in these different areas of, of investments and uh, just accounting and and uh, registration and those kinds of things. Uh, another uh, great uh, great reason to use shared services is that their efficiency is gained. Again, when you have someone who's an expert in what they're doing, they're going to get it done a lot faster. And so, uh, you know, we found in PeopleSoft it just takes takes forever to do bank recs. But but uh, when Jatasa supposed to, they can do it in a couple of hours. And so and so that's a lot of time saved in uh, in terms of trying to get your books closed by the end of the month and and uh, get your JTE scores up and those kind of things. It also helps reduce uh, distractions. We'll talk about unemployment insurance later in, in the webinar. And, and there's just a lot of, it's just hassle having to deal with unemployment claims and appeals. And, and so using a shared service with experts, professionally trained experts, uh, will, will, will help get all of that out of the office and, and get it on folks who, who know what they're doing, can, can do it well, and can save, uh, can save the council money and heartache. Uh, it simplifies the council structure in many, in many cases uh, uh, councils have restructured in a way that allows them to focus more of their front counter, uh, employee attention on customer service, more of their uh, field staff, district executives on customer service. And, uh, and so again, is, is, is this uh, is back office uh, headaches and heartaches go away, uh, it, there's a whole lot less stress in the building and, and things go a lot more smoothly. And then finally, but certainly not the prime motivation, uh, the reason that you uh, want to consider shared services is that th there's a good chance to save uh, the council money. And when we get to the end of the program, there'll be a number of, uh, of finance-related shared services. Well, there actually will be savings to the council through use of the shared service. And it's just it's just that it's just a pure uh, uh, buying things that reduce cost and, and, and spending less money on on the things that spend uh, day to day. So kicking us off, we're going to uh, ask, uh, turn it over to Steve Dow, who's going to talk to us about Jatasa. Steve? Great. Thanks, Mike. And um, uh, you happen to mention I'm the, the vice president of sales again. I, and you always give me that promotion. Just, just to clarify, I'm the, the director of sales. I'll take the promotion in any pay raise you can uh, offer me, but uh, no, I'm the, the director of sales uh, with Jatasa. See, this is um, kind of like the Boy Scouts. We just give you a, a, a bigger title in lieu of a raise. That's how that works. So, well, <laughs> and that happens around here as well. And uh, you know, you get the you get the title, get the responsibilities. But um, I'll I'll take the pay raise. If, if that's all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I appreciate it, Mike, and, and the opportunity to talk here. And what I want to do is just talk through our relationship with the BSA and and really start off with where we got started back in January of 2011. Uh, when we were selected by Chris Wolf and the Finance Impact Department to initiate a pilot engagement 
to provide the accounting services with the Hoosier Trails Council in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, the Hoosier Trails Council was, was a, a, a typical council uh, uh, size and, and such. And the, at the time, they had recently lost their accounting specialist. They were going through a transition. Glenn Steenberger, the, the scout executive, was was beginning the recruiting process. And, and Chris approached him, and Glenn agreed to, to allow this pilot to take place. And so over the course of the next four or five months, we began working with the council, taking on the bookkeeping and accounting activities, while the Finance Impact Department and the National Council uh, vetted our processes. They came out and visited our service center here in Boise, Idaho, uh, looked at the way we worked with uh, the Hoosier Trails Council and, and how we managed uh, everything from our IT security processes to our operational procedures. And as of May of that year, at the national meeting, uh, we were introduced as the preferred vendor for accounting services for local councils. And as you can see here, since that time, we've signed 41 councils as clients across the country. And these are councils from all four regions that range in size from small level 500 councils in rural parts of the country to very large level 200 councils in some of the, the urban markets. And the point of this slide is to demonstrate the, the breadth and, and depth of experience our accounting team has in working with local councils. We understand the challenges the councils face, both operationally and financially. We understand the BSA systems very well and the, the unique intricacies of, of BSA accounting, which uh, are indeed uh, quite unique and complicated at times. In terms of the approach with all of those councils then, uh, we call it a, a refer to it as a, as a team-based approach. And on the left side of the slide here, you see what we call a council service team. So every council is assigned to a primary accounting associate that leads that council service team. And he or she is the main point of contact for the council for daily, weekly, and monthly communication on the, the various accounting tasks. And then depending on the size and complexity of the council, there will be one or more supporting accounting associates. So we always have at least two and often more accounting associates that make up the council service team. And again, they're, they're taking care of the, the routine tasks. We had an, another team, uh, you see on the right side of the slide here, the specialist team we refer to them. And this is where a number of our CPAs reside and, and some of our more experienced accountants. But they'll focus or specialize in areas such as endowments or, or fixed assets or, uh, or, or capital management or financial analyses. And a specialist team will overlap all of our council service teams at supporting each council depending on their specific needs and scope of services and, and complexity. So I, I often say that as opposed to a single accounting specialist or single bookkeeper or, or accountant, when the council signs with JITASA, you're effectively getting a, a, an entire accounting department to take care of all the various needs depending on, on what they are. In terms of the, the roles and responsibilities then, as we roll in the engagement, on the JITASA side of the relationship, you can see the, the outline here of the, the tasks, and, and there's greater detail than this, but a high-level overview of the tasks that we take on that range from managing accounts payable to coordinating payroll through IOI, uh, taking care of the bank reconciliations, as, as Mike referenced a couple minutes ago, uh, within PeopleSoft, as, and, as well as any sub-budget reconciliations. Uh, performing the, the monthly or running the monthly statements and, and preparing to close the month, and then on an annual basis, certainly supporting the client through or the council through, uh, through audit. Uh, in addition, the specialist team I referenced, they'll get involved in the, what I call the heavier lifting, the, the capital fund reconciliations or endowment fund reconciliations uh, for funds two and three, and, uh, and any fixed asset depreciation models that need to be run. So that's the JITASA side of the, the roles and responsibilities. On the council side, we always have very close engagement with the scout executive. So he or she will be involved with our team in, in reviewing monthly financials, uh, and preparing to close the month, and preparing for the, the monthly board meeting. We also identify the uh, approved personnel for approvals. In other words, who in the council will be, uh, will be accessing for approving AP runs and uh, for example, payroll runs, uh, always the scout executive and typically the, the treasurer or one or more other board members. This third uh, individual here is what we call a council coordinator. This is an important role, and this is the person in the council uh, team or council office who will be our key point of contact. 
So this is someone who our team will reach out to for, for answers to questions or, or someone who will know where to get answers to questions. Or for example, uh, since invoices and bills will still come into the council office, this person will, will gather those invoices, code them, uh, and scan them over to our team so we can work with them in PeopleSoft. It, it's, it's an important role. It doesn't necessarily require accounting knowledge. While, while that would be helpful, what's more important is that it's someone who, who understands the operations of the council. And, and folks who fill this, this function or this role range from office managers to registrars to directors of support service to assistant scout executives, just someone on the council team who can be our key point of contact. And then finally, we always have close engagement with the council treasurer or VP of finance. Uh, we always encourage the, that individual to be involved along with the scout executive in the reviewing of the, the monthly financials at the end of the month before we close the month and again preparing for the, the monthly board meeting. So that's an overview of the, the roles and responsibilities of the, the relationship. In terms of where we work within the BSA systems, this slide gives a, a good schematic overview of, of where the JITAS team operates. Now if you see this, this gray box in the middle here, that depicts the BSA firewall. And an important point, uh, during that, that uh, vetting and review uh, I referenced a, a couple minutes ago, early in our engagement, the, the National Council uh, approved JITASA uh, as the first vendor to have full access through the BSA firewall. And that was an important milestone because that allowed our team here in our service center in Boise to work in our, our count, client council's PeopleSoft files, uh, and at that time it was ScoutNet files, but, but to access the, the council's files just as though we were sitting in a council office. So it, it allowed us to achieve a great level of efficiency and, and speed in, in the way we work through the council's, uh, council's files. But if, if you look at this, uh, this schematic then, and on the left-hand side you see the, the systems that provide dollars coming into the council, and primarily cell-wise, registration, and fundraising. Now the JITASA team does not work within those systems. Those, those functions still reside uh, as a responsibility of the council. However, we take the financial data through daily uploads from those systems and then manage the allocations and recording within PeopleSoft. Then on the other side of the, the, of the, the slide here, the dollars going out, if you will, the JITASA team will get involved in the managing of, of the accounts payable process in getting approvals for the AP run and physically printing the checks at JITASA, signing them on behalf of the council, and mailing them to the council vendors from, uh, from our service center here in Boise. So that's the, the AP function. Similarly for payroll, we'll work with the council to, to gather and, and gain approvals on the, the necessary timesheets and coordinate with IOI pay to submit those pay timesheets to achieve the, the council's uh, uh, monthly payroll or, or, or bi-monthly payroll so that the council staff is, is certainly being paid. So again, just a, a, an overview of where JITASA operates, taking the dollars coming in and managing the dollars going out, doing so all within PeopleSoft. So to summarize uh, some of the key benefits that we're, we're trying to bring to the, the councils that we work with in, in the time that we have with the, uh, uh, the time of experience we've had with working with these councils. Uh, first is when a council comes to us, uh, either because they've had a vacancy or turnover in the position, or simply because they need help in supporting their existing accounting specialists, we're able to provide immediate access to the expertise our, our team has in working within the BSA accounting systems and processes and procedures. Part of that is our, our, the breadth and depth of experience that we have in PeopleSoft. Uh, as Mike mentioned, a lot of the PeopleSoft functions as a very complex software uh, can be a challenge, and, and this is what our team does every day, and, and that, that experience is what we're able to bring in the engagements when we, as we get, get started. The support from that team I referenced earlier, the, the, the team approach providing the, the various resources to achieve certain efficiencies. Uh, in addition, we're able to, to provide controls through segregation of duties. For example, we'll have a, a different uh, associate processing 
uh, AP and payroll on behalf of the, of the council than is the individual who's reconciling the bank and sub-ledger accounts at the end of the month. So from, a, from an audit trail standpoint, being able to show the segregation of those duties and also ensuring we're, we're consistently available to support the council through that, that team-based approach. We're, we're able to provide greater transparency and visibility to the council of financials or council financials, and, and in doing so, the insights that we can share with the, the financial reviews at, at month end and, and getting the scout executive and treasurer involved and supporting them in preparing for their, their board meetings, uh, we're just able to focus on it and provide a, a higher level of transparency than the council may have had in the past. The issue of council employee turnover goes away. Uh, Typically, a lot of, uh, most often it will come to a council or a council will, will, will come to us, rather, because they've had turnover in the accounting specialist position. And as opposed to hiring a new accounting specialist and going through the recruiting process and training process and then possibly learning, lead, excuse me, losing that accounting specialist again, with the JITASA team, we, we maintain or provide a level of consistency and stability. Uh, if we have a change in our staff, there's no impact to the council because remember we've got a team of folks who are familiar with the council's books, so we don't miss a beat in maintaining that consistent service and, and coverage. Part of that is what we call vendor management process or benefits versus employee management. So not only is that turnover function uh, taken away, but just the, the general employee management. So for example, if, if something happens or we make a mistake and, and something goes wrong, which we do, those issues do come up, the scout executive has a conversation with us and, and we sit around together to figure out what procedurally needs to be changed. We make those changes to prevent that mistake from happening again, and then we move forward versus an employee situation where the scout executive may have to have a, a, a training discussion uh, or in some cases perhaps document what has happened or consider what, how that employee may respond to the feedback they're receiving. So that element, that, that, that management function goes away and strictly managing the, vendors, um, the vendor relationship in the, um, in the engagement. And finally, allowing therefore the scout executive and the council staff to have greater focus on the, 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 the reasons they're, they're in their roles, to drive membership programs and fundraising, to drive the scouting mission while we're providing the financial information uh, to allow them to do so and make the decisions to move that forward. So that's a summary of the benefits. Uh, just in case there's a need for more information or someone wants to talk through scenarios or, or options or uh, or just kick around ideas for the council, certainly I'm available via, via email or, or, or phone call. I speak with councils every week. I'd be happy to do so at any time. So, uh, so with that, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. And again, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Great. Thanks, Steve. And we appreciate your being with us tonight. And part of the meeting, uh, if, you, if you're on this live, part of the meeting request has a number of documents on it. And uh, there's a kind of a one-page document. Uh, it's, it's a story of who's your trails counsel, a testimonial from your scout executive about his experience, and then the contact information from Jatasa is there as well. So certainly uh, we've got lots of ways for you to uh, get in touch with Steve. So next we want to turn, uh, turn the webinar over, webinar over to uh, Bill Collette, uh, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, BSAM. Bill? Good evening. Thank you. BSAM, what we're talking about today is the BSA Commingled Endowment Fund. And that is an endowment fund that is established and offered by BSA Asset Management LLC. Now that fund, that uh, BSA Asset Management LLC, the, the if you will, parent uh, of the fund has a board of managers that are volunteers, Appointed by the executive board, and they are the ones that oversee the investment decisions that are made on behalf of the commingled endowment fund. The commingled endowment fund is a fund that is established to provide a high quality, low cost investment option to councils, any council that wishes to participate. And those councils are participating expecting to invest in a product which will support their spending policy that they've established for their endowment fund. That spending policy is generally 5% um, or less, and that spending policy is 
is the policy that is determined determines the investment strategy of BSAM itself. Now BSAM, the overarching fund here, Boy Scout Asset Management, is actually a two billion dollar fund. They have about two billion dollars under management, or not two billion dollar fund, but they have two two billion dollars under management. Uh, at this point, more than half of that is pension money that is invested on behalf of the Boy Scouts of America. And the other large pieces in there uh, are defined contribution plan and a number of other benefit plans invested on behalf, again, of the, the scouting executive and scouting, uh, national scouting executive, and the endowment fund itself is the commingled fund is about a quarter of that $2 billion fund, about $535 million out of the $2 billion. So $2 billion fund, substantial fund that is managed by DSAM itself. The commingled endowment fund, as I noted, is specifically designed to support spending policy. That means that the asset allocation is established such that the targeted earnings from the fund will include the 5% spending rate plus an inflation factor plus 60 basis points in costs for operating the fund. The fund is managed on a an institutional basis that is similar to all funds or many funds that you would see in the market, um, in the mutual fund market generally, or there's not a mutual fund available, it's available only to councils. Now, the cost, the 60, the, the cost of actually operating the fund, 60 basis points on an all-in basis, which includes eight basis points from BSAM, is a low cost for this type of a fund and this type of uh, investment levels. How do they do that? Well, they, they can do that because they are achieving economies of scale uh, through their asset management practices and their asset management practices that apply all the way across their $2 billion in assets under management. There is also an endowment master trust option that's available for councils who retain a corporate trustee, that 15 basis point trustee fee is in addition to the 60 basis points um, that, you, that are noted up above as the BSAM uh, commingled endowment fund costs. Now, the $535 million commingled endowment fund as an asset allocation that's established to support the spending policy. What that means is that the assets that are present in the fund are a diversified mix of equity and fixed income, real estate, and non-US equities as well. Now, those assets are picked and established to generate the highest possible return for the lowest possible risk, which is to say that the fund is managed to be as investment efficient as possible. Now that investment that investment allocation and all has had very good results. Over the three years that ended in June of 2013, the return for the BSAM fund on an annualized basis was about 11.7%. That compares very well to funds that you could pick as funds that have a similar investment objective. That investment objective being operating funds, distributions out of the fund to support programs. And the list here, as you'll see, are university endowment funds. Those are very good comparables to the mission of the BSAM fund for the councils. Those university endowment funds over that same three-year period 
returned anywhere between 10.2% in the case of Cornell all the way to 12.8% in the case of Yale. But what you see there is that BSAM falls right in the middle of the range at 11.7%. That's very good. That is very good performance over that period of time for the same level of risk at all. So this is a this is a fund that is very well established and very well managed. And that management is to the benefit of those councils that are participating. Councils participating today in the Western region, at least, there are 14 councils that are participating in the commingled endowment fund. And you see them noted here, uh, California Inland Empire Council, uh, which is a council that not only participates in BSAM, but has, participates in many of the shared services that have been and will be talked about today. These councils, as you'll see, have substantial endowments of, of their own, and these councils have, have endowments that are generating a spending policy number that fits within BSAM, the BSAM mix, and also these councils are enjoying the efficiency of investing in a fund where the administrative burden and the operational burden of investing in the fund has been largely removed. The council, councils retain their own endowment committee. They retain their own board control of the BSAM investment they have. That control and those endowment committees have the same responsibilities. They are now, however, doing it in a way that is simple uh, in terms of, a, in most cases, a single point of investment for the endowment funds. In some cases, they have multiple managers, and most they don't. So, how do you get involved in BSAM? Well, it's there's a the way to do it is to contact BSAM directly, and we'll make note of the contact information here at the end of the presentation. The investment endowment committee that, that you have established in your council would see presentations, and your board would go through an approval process for an, a, a BSAM engagement with approval you then enter into the documentation that normally goes along with investment in any kind of a fund. And that documentation, subscription agreement, um, and a trust option, if, if applicable, um, would be entered into by the council. Council moves their funds to BSAM, and they are under operation. Now, there's a transition process for all of these from a, a current situation. If you have a current manager, um, all of these processes are actually well documented and understood in the industries and can be undertaken in a very efficient manner without losing value. The council then uh, receives the benefit of the BSAM engagement through its operational uh, it's operational processes where distributions can be established on whatever frequency, whatever schedule that the council needs to have that frequent needs to have that distribution occur monthly, quarterly, one time, semi-annual, whatever the frequency happens to be, and the councils have monthly performance and accounting reports and fund reports on a quarterly basis. All that documentation, all that reporting documentation uh, will support the council's responsibility to report on the, the funds and to meet their fiduciary duty to the council and the endowment fund itself. So this, as I, as I noted, has been um, a very successful product and a very well received product in a number of councils. We have a number of a number of uh, councils that have spoken to that and video 
that we're going to queue up right now and you'll get a sense of why DSAM has achieved the success that they have over this period in time and why you ought to think about it. Great. Thanks, Bill. And, and for those that are you are watching the video, it should pop up. If it doesn't, on the right-hand side of your screen, you may see a slider bar. And if you see a big white space here when the video is playing, run that slider bar down. You may be able to pick up the video right there. Our customer service experience has always been fantastic. Uh, and the board members that are part of that committee love the support materials that they receive. They use it as part of their uh, presentation and services and talking to people about making an investment in endowment for our whole council. Uh, additionally, on the back side of the office, our controller loves the customer service that they get from DCM. Any questions or concerns that she has immediately handled uh, and the turnaround uh, and all aspects of customer service has been fantastic. You know, our experience transitioning to DSAM has been really great and uh, smooth, uh, no problems, and all the transactions we've had since have been equally smooth. It's been a, a terrific a transition from our previous investment management firm to DSAM and very smooth. Uh, we've been involved for about six months now. Uh, the communication has been excellent. Uh, the information I needed as well as my accounting specialist and our endowment committee have gotten everything they need. The investment process itself is very solid and very sound. Um, it helps us uh, manage our assets um, to a larger pool. Uh, it also frees our volunteers up to focus more on growth than worrying about asset allocations and worrying about the things that you would with a fund. So for us, it's, it's easier. It gives us that experience in a larger fund. For me, it's a much more efficient use of our time and allows us to take that limited time that our volunteers have and focus it on the things that we need, which is acquiring additional knowledge gifts. I think it's critical for every council and executive board to consider BSAM. When you, when you measure the performance versus cost, volunteer time, it just makes all the sense to give it an opportunity. I would tell other council scout executives their endowment committee and their executive boards, you do not want to pass by an opportunity to consider BSAM. When you put out your RFP, and I know a lot of us every five to seven years look at investment management firms, you would be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't bring in BSAM and allow them to present. When I think about BSAM and the value that it brings to the organization, I think about the council. And these people have a lot to do. Uh, they're generally short staff, uh, they're short of resources, and managing assets is a very complex, it's a very sophisticated thing, it's a very expensive thing to do. And what BSAM does is relieves that kind of responsibility and day-to-day -day requirements from these councils, let them focus on what they do, and that is serve more youth, serve the kids, serve the communities where they live and work. As I mentioned, uh, get involved. You need to be a contact BSAM, and the person that you'd want to contact is Ken King. He's the Director of Client Service and Operations. Ken's located in Texas, but he's available by phone. There, as you can see, at 972-580-2065, or you can get a hold of him uh, via email at bsam2as at scouting.org. DSAM, this is a this is a product that fits right into the shared service mission and the shared service objectives and is, is one that is very consistent all the way through. It's a great product that um, could save you some money, but it saves you more than money uh, by taking a look at this on a long-term basis. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. Great. Thanks, Bill, very much, and uh, we appreciate uh, we appreciate your time tonight helping us with this. So uh, on the line joining us is uh, D Joe Danishevsky. Joe is the scout executive of the California Inland Empire Council. Uh, uses, uh, you saw him there, star stage and screen, right on the video for BSAM, uses BSAM, uses JATASA, any number of these other services, and 
And Joe, you want to uh, just uh, uh, kind of give us some sense of, of, of why this works for your council and why you've chosen to, to use so many of these services? Sure, sure, Mike. Uh, um, as Mike mentioned, our council uh, does partake of a lot of these uh, services that the National Council uh, puts their time and energy in, and uh, uh, our executive board feel very strongly that uh, if BSA uh, does a, a really good job of vetting and uh, you know, we do our own homework, uh, the relationships that we build with JATASA, BSAM, uh, and I could, I'm, I'm looking at all the webinar materials. Uh, you know, we, we, we work with uh, these shared services and more, and uh, it really allows us to do a, a better job uh, as stewards, um, as, as good uh, fiduciary agents of the council, um, and to really, you know, focus on uh, the things that we can't share, and that would be uh, service to our young people, our units, our charter organizations, uh, and to, to raise the money uh, to be able to support that. So um, I think you already heard from Steve Dowd uh, and JATASA, and uh, what I'll add there is that uh, uh, we have been very pleased in the two years we've been with JATASA. Uh, we uh, had tried uh, 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 brand new accounting specialists uh, in-house, and uh, with the, the change to PeopleSoft and some um, really needing to, to take our audit to another level, uh, we, we really felt JATASA uh, had the expertise and the competence uh, to be able to work with to, to really help us uh, do a great job on our audit, and we, and we did. We had a great clean audit in 2012 and, and, and also one in 2013. Uh, and it's to the point where uh, you're truly working uh, with a whole team at JATASA uh, that complements the team that you have. Uh, we, we have an assistant accountant, and her role as a coordinator with JATASA is just as important as JATASA's role. So uh, the reports I get, uh, you know, I'm 100% confident uh, in their accuracy and their timeliness. Uh, do I have to, to manage the process? I, I think I do need to spend a little bit more time to manage it when I had an in-house accounting specialist. Am I much, much more pleased with the accuracy in the audits? Uh, they're ba it's basically priceless how much more accurate and, and, and how the audits are going. So uh, I, I'm a very uh, big fan of uh, what JATASA can, can offer a Boy Scout Council. Uh, you heard a lot about BSAM. Uh, again, our, when our board found out that we had a, a service like that through the, the Boy Scouts of America Asset Management, they were very excited. And uh, there's an area by working with BSAM. Uh, JATAS is thrilled working with BSAM as far as uh, making sure that you know, all the bookkeeping is accurate. Uh, we're thrilled because of the reports we get. And, uh, Make sure you look at that bar graph that BSAM offers as far as the return on investment and how it matches up to some of the other major university endowments. And I think uh, you'll, you'll, have the, you'll make the time to find out more. Um, we actually have looked at membership uh, data services, shared services, and uh, the team there has been very, um, very helpful and very uh, supportive of our analysis of it, and uh, w we haven't pulled the trigger on that one yet, but I feel very good that if I did have a transition in my uh, registration support services, that that would be a resource I could call on and, uh, and make a move if I needed to. So uh, the camp card, uh, I was just talking to uh, our director of field service, and we, we played with the national version a little bit this year with our exploring posts, and uh, we're gearing up to uh, embrace that full, full bore in, uh, in 2015. So we're putting together our, our timeline and, and recruiting a, a, a council chair for that as well. 
So uh, that's our uh, uh, working relationships with some, some great uh, vendors, uh, and uh, I'm available if there's any questions. Great. Thanks, Joe, very much. We appreciate your support of, uh, of the folks that we're featuring tonight as well as just your, uh, uh, just your good work in uh, the California Inland Empire Council. Thanks a bunch for being Thank with you. us this afternoon. So next up, we want to talk about uh, member data shared services. And, and uh, what this is, uh, in fact, is basically the registration department in a local council. So this all started uh, about three years ago. Uh, the state of Michigan uh, put 11 councils together into one council. And the whole idea being if they could get rid of uh, a, a number of the back office staff in those 11 councils, then they could, they could turn those dollars, repurpose those dollars into unit serving executives and put more district executives out on the street recruiting kids and serving leaders. And so uh, the National Council was charged with uh, building a registration department uh, to help support that Michigan model. Well, it's worked so well that we've rolled that out to the entire country. And uh, it's really a, a very easy process to uh, uh, work with. So a lot of the things are exactly the same as they are now. The council still receives all the registration paperwork. The applications come across the front counter. The, the charter papers come across the front counter. All the paperwork continues to come into the local council service center. And the council, as they receive that, uh, those registration and application forms, they receive, they, they receive the fees, right? Ring it up in cell-wise, put it in unit accounts, whatever happens there, all the money comes through the unit, uh, through the uh, uh, local council as well. And then the applications still have to be approved. Uh, all adult applications have to have the scout executive or a scout executive designee signature. So uh, you, you don't lose any accuracy. You don't lose uh, any control of cash for cash flow. All of that continues to happen as it, uh, as it normally does. The big difference, the biggest difference now is then that once that, once that uh, all the paperwork comes across the counter and it gets rung up, then it's scanned using a high-speed scanner securely to a, a, a registration uh, data entry folks that sit down at the National Council, and they do all of the data entry. So uh, at the uh, member data shared service, uh, the, the employees there, uh, the first thing they do is review paperwork for accuracy and completeness, just like your registrar would do now. They're looking for signatures. They're looking to make sure the right money came in. They're looking for social security numbers. If it's an adult, they're looking for that front page of the application signed. If it's an adult, for permission to a criminal background check, they're looking for all of that stuff. And then if there is something defective, if there's something missing, uh, then they notify just the uh, appropriate district executive by email. And so this is really important because a, lot, a number of times I've been in local councils doing administrative reviews and other council work, I go to the registrar and ask about the defective file. There's always a manila file folder on her desk, pretty thick typically, or maybe there's one for every district, and they're, they, you know, they've all got stuff in them. And, and so what happens typically now in a council is the paperwork comes in, it's defective, it gets filed, and then it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Nobody's paying attention. And so what we've got then are leaders who registered. I mean, they filled out the application, they paid the $24, they think they're registered, they think there's been a background check, the charter partner thinks there's been a background check, when in fact, if that application was missing information, it's sitting in a file folder on a desk. And so uh, we're very concerned about youth protection and our young people meeting with leaders who are uh, appropriately uh, uh, checked out before they meet with kids. And so this immediate notification by email makes it really great because uh, the information is, if it's defective, that, that registration or application is emailed to a district executive, the sensitive information is covered up so it can't be seen as part of that email. And then a DE can move that around. They, they've got it in the field where they can uh, – print it off and take it to somebody, they've got it where they can forward an email to the leader or the cub master or the scout master, somebody to get it signed and get it back. And so typically now it's the DE comes in for a staff meeting, they maybe go to the defective file, they pick the stuff up, they take it to the field, they've got to bring it back to the office. A lot of delays, a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of stuff missed there. This, this whole electronic moving it around electronically really speeds that up and cleans it up quite a bit. The next thing then is the, uh, the, the, the uh, data entry clerks, then they post all the registration, they submit all the leaders for a background check, they uh, store the, the front page of that application uh, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the adult leader uh, signs approval that we can do a background check, those have to be stored electronically and there are file cabinets full of these things right now. 
We take care of all of that electronically. We have it available if there is a youth protection issue, but, it, but, it, but it's not a filing problem for the local council. And finally, this is a big one related to customer service. Uh, we print and mail membership cards every week. And uh, many cases, again, where I visited councils, this is a fact of the uh, applications come in in the fall, the registrar is too busy, so they don't send out membership cards, or the recharters come in in December, and then about maybe February, March, April, the membership cards and the recharter uh, faces are going back out, and leaders are frustrated by that. Uh, in our department, we can ramp up or ramp down depending on the volume and the business cycle and uh, so that we can get that stuff done in a timely fashion. So the benefit to the district executive is, again, that these defective notices of defective registration get emailed directly to them. Uh, you can actually customize that. In one council, uh, the commissioner gets a copy as well as the district executive. So now we've got two people working on this. After two or three reminders, this isn't cleaned up. This is a weekly report that automatically is uh, scheduled to go out. The scout executive gets involved. And so the district executives can spend more time in the field and less time in the office uh, bringing stuff back and forth uh, to try and get it cleaned up. So there are some process improvements as well. Uh, one of the things uh, and now that typically doesn't get done is uh, uh, the registrars don't know what report to run for the accounting specialist so that, so that they can reconcile this, how much money came in and how much money is going out on a monthly or weekly basis. In our system, uh, this report comes out um, every week. There's a report mailed to the accounting specialist that tells them how much money was collected by the council. And the National Council polls twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. And so the amount of money that will be polled on each of those days is, um, is, is identified in that report so that the scout executives knows for cash flow uh, just exactly how much is going to be pulled directly from their bank account on which day. There are customized reporting tools as well as month-end reports. Of course, all of the month-end reports are, are produced and emailed to the council. But with ScoutNet being what it is, it's, it's, uh, it's running out of life. We're trying to replace it with something else. We're not, we're not writing any more reports at ScoutNet. But our uh, shared service employees down there are, uh, have, have developed customized reports that are in Access or in Excel, and uh, they're using those with councils and producing those for councils so that it gives councils uh, a little bit of extra service uh, in addition to what they would normally could expect from a registrar in their office. So uh, new and available uh, in addition to registration, uh, starting uh, 1st of September, uh, that, that, that member data service also will enter advancement and training data. Again, another pain point for units. Leaders get trained. Leaders, the registrar puts it in the, in the computer. If it's not put in correctly, then the recharter comes out and the leader doesn't show us being trained. And folks are pulling their hair out. So uh, in this way, again, you send us the advancement report. If it's not internet re uh, advancement, you send us the training attendance list. All that stuff goes in, so when recharters get uh, pulled, all the information on them is accurate. So uh, we do have information here for uh, Sandy Trevino, and um, uh, she is the, uh, the team leader for all of our uh, uh, member data uh, shared services. And we've got another uh, video uh, from a couple of scout executives talking about their experience with this particular product. Again, uh, you, may, you, may have, you may have to use a scroll bar to pull your screen down if the video doesn't pop up directly. Membership Shared Services recently came about when our registrar retired. We were able to, uh, to take our, our registration service from the back office reduce that and, uh, and increase our amount of member experience folks that we have at our front counter. We are uh, looking for a cost saving. We took and eliminated virtually 11 positions as registrars in each council, put back the responsibility of serving the unit by the unit serving executive, and hired on with the National Council to have all of our registration done by them. Well, when a volunteer walks or a member walks into our office, we want them to have a very engaging experience with staff. We can uh, take better care of our members and give them a better experience. It's all about the idea of better service. And the whole concept of the Michigan Crossroads Council is better service to unit leaders so that they get, in fact, better program to their kids and to our members. Today, the unit serving executive is truly helping his unit or her unit 
get that stuff done ahead of time, and it, it connects them with the unit more so. So we take the paperwork and send it down there and have all of the uh, uh, detail kind of thing done there, and it's online. Our district executives and volunteers in the field both are aware of that and have worked out systems to be able to more effectively and efficiently track down those so that we can get our registration process in a more timely manner. And I think the involvement of volunteers in that process really strengthens the credibility of what we're doing in the movement with our membership. The idea that we could get um, the most amount of service to our unit leaders through shared services and reducing the amount of uh, back office uh, support staff and still do better service because unit executives are involved in the whole process. The benefit to our district executives is it allows them more time in the field, focusing on, on uh, customer relations and member experiences out in the field, recruiting volunteers, donor relations, those types of things. And if a defective charter comes in, they can take care of it immediately while they're still in the field, not having to come to the office to do that. All right, so again, if you have any questions, they're on the meeting, on the meeting notice that came out, the calendar notice that came out, there, there are one sheet flyers on each of these different shared services. There's more information there. I uh, do want to make you aware that it is uh, the, the uh, uh, member data shared services transactional based. So an application is a transaction or a charter is a transaction. All fees are based on the average of the last three years worth of transactions. And, um, and then, of course, if you, if you add advancement and training, then it's just based on, right, it's just somebody typing stuff in a computer. So it's just based on the amount of uh, data entry work that's being done. So for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of our uh, conference, we're going to be talking about a number of financial shared services. And these are uh, services where, where actually, in fact, the council can save money. Uh, also uh, gives you the ability to uh, use experts, uh, subject matter experts within these particular fields. So the first one is Mercury Pay. They're a credit card processor. They're the preferred credit card processor for the Boy Scouts. And what that means, when you swipe a credit card at the front desk, there's a, there's a processing uh, processor, credit card processor, between that swipe and the bank where you get your money. And so Mercury Pay uh, is our preferred vendor because they have end-to-end -end encryption between cell-wise and, and their processing uh, facilities. And what that means is when the, when the credit card is swiped, then the number is, is encrypted as it goes across the Internet. Uh, no, no credit card information is stored on any computers anyplace, and so it's a very safe way to, to handle uh, credit card processing. So up until now, uh, the uh, fees for that uh, uh, Mercury Pay have been $0.10 cents per swipe plus 1.67% of the, of the transaction. So for a $100 sale, think about a Cub Scout uniform, that's about $100 it would be $1.77 in fees to the council plus 2 or 3% to go to the credit card companies, MasterCard, Visa. What we did is put together uh, and look at all of the local councils and how much do all of them have in credit card processing and, and uh, cut a new, uh, negotiate a new rate of $0.14 cents a transaction. So that's from $1.77 to $0.14. Cents. They'll have to pay the 2 or 3% interchange fee to credit card companies, but that's a big savings. And so uh, in Michigan, uh, that was a $70,000 savings annually in a, in a Class 500 council. In Minnesota and Alabama, that's between $3,500 and $5,000 in savings. So if you are a Mercury Pay, uh, if you're using Mercury Pay now, then you do have to sign a new three-year agreement to get the $0.14. Cents. If you're not using Mercury Pay, uh, you, can contact the, uh, you can contact them. They'll do an analysis and help you understand whether or not this would be uh, the right thing for you to do to switch. And again, there's a one sheet on that meeting notice about Mercury Pay. Uh, next is group purchasing. And group purchasing, we have two opportunities available. The first one is Jim Horner and our National Council is leveraging the spending power of the National Council. He has a, a list of about 20 vendors, and that's one of those uh, one sheets. Uh, including one of those includes things like Office Depot, um, uh, Polaris, uh, and, and uh, uh, Lowe's uh, Lumberyards. And then purchasing point, we, the Boy Scouts is one of uh, 18 national uh, not-for-profit agencies that have gone together in, under an umbrella to create another group purchasing option. It's 120 vendors. They've got all the cell phone companies, all the rental cars. They've got Pitney Bowes, your postage machine in the back office. And they've got Staples. So here's the message. Nobody, no council should be paying full price for your office supplies. 
You can get a discount at Office Depot through Jim Horner's program. Uh, and Office Max, of course, as they uh, merge, and then you can get a uh, or you can get a discount at Staples or both. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, so, so don't pay full price for office supplies. Uh, Cap Cellwise, we're familiar with Cellwise as our point of sale software, and, and uh, so we want to make sure you're aware that our contractual agreement with them is a two-hour guarantee for returning support calls. But then uh, we also want to make you aware of a new technology that in October of 2015, a year from now. The United States will be adopting EM, EMV, or what's called chip and pin credit card uh, processing. And so if you look at the credit cards in your wallet, probably at least one of them has a little gold thing on the front of it. It looks like a, like a, like a, um, a, cir a circuit board. Well, that's the chip that we're talking about. And the difference is instead of a swipe, cards with a chip will have to be inserted in the machine in a slot in the front of the machine. The, the user puts in a four-digit pin, then they pull the card out. The card never leaves their possession. This is all about credit card fraud and uh, security. And so uh, councils and all merchants by next year will have to be buying new credit card machines that have an insertion slot in the front. And the money you can save at Mercury Pay from, from switching uh, pricing there will more than pay for these uh, chip and pin uh, uh, machines that you're going to have to buy over the next year. We also have a new auditor referral program, again, trying to leverage uh, the dollars spent by all councils uh, in a way that helps everybody uh, lower the price. And so we've identified four different audit firms, uh, one for each region, uh, and uh, these firms have agreed they, they've, they've done Boy Scout audits, they're familiar with Boy Scout accounting, uh, and what they've agreed to do is uh, work uh, uh, to do council audits, and as more councils go to them to give audits, it gets easier for them. It gets cheaper for them. They then uh, pass the lower price on to, to uh, Boy Scout Council. So try and reduce the cost of your audit as uh, this begins to build momentum. Kind of the interesting thing about this is that these, uh, all these audit programs, uh, our auditors can do um, remote audits. So you don't have to just use the one in your region. They can do these audits without anybody showing up uh, in your building uh, to do the work. Uh, IOI Pay, uh, of course, where everyone in the country is using IOI Pay now, so thank you very much for going to IOI Pay. The next savings level there is uh, to go paperless. Uh, all employees, including camp employees, get direct deposits or camp cards, and then all employees get a, a web app and a mobile app that helps them see the paycheck and the payroll information as it comes available. The camp card program that uh, Joe talked about, so the National Council uh, has secured entertainment book as the merchant to uh, solicit all the ads. And so uh, if you're in a local council, you're doing a camp card yourself, somebody on your staff has to go out, find the merchants, get them to agree, sign an agreement, take the artwork to the printer, order the cards, you know, all of that stuff. In, in this particular case, entertainment book does all the work. Uh, they, they secure the ads. They take care of the paperwork. Uh, your council simply orders the cards, and uh, and then and then turns them over to the to the scouts to, to uh, uh, sell uh, door to door or however they're going to do that. And and the, and the pricing is competitive when you think about the amount of time that it takes to uh, do this on your own. Another new uh, program is uh, Heartsook. Heartsook is a well-known fundraising major gift and endowment fundraising group. <coughs> Excuse me. They also have agreed to work in the operating fund. And so this is. Um, Anytime a council has a need to, to, to hire a new finance director or replace a finance director, uh, the Heartsook option may be for you. They, they've agreed to work in Friends of Scouting, special events, United, filling out the United Way forms, popcorn sale, everything related to the operating fund. You'll have a proven, demonstrated fundraising expert working for your council on a full-time, part-time, or a shared time with other councils um, uh, related uh, specifically in the operating fund. Uh, the BSA Unemployment Services is unemployment, and uh, if you ever had to f work with unemployment claims, they're a nuisance. You've got forms to fill out. You've got uh, phone conferences if there's an appeal. It's a lot of hassle. It's a lot of trouble. You've got a check that they are getting the, you're getting billed the right amount by the state over the last 12, nine quarters, all of that. I mean, it's just a lot of heartache. And so, again, uh, uh, trained professionals uh, working in these fields uh, work on your behalf to handle the claim, handle the appeals, fill out the paperwork. They just do all that stuff for you. 
And if you have a planned reduction in force or you've got a planned reason that someone has to be terminated, they can work with you to make sure that you've, you've got all the pieces in place to reduce the council's liability, reduce the uh, potential of a so again, all of these pieces uh, are available. Uh, you can contact me. You can contact any of the presenters specifically that work today or all the information to contact these folks is on those one-sheet flyers that we've uh, included uh, with our meeting notice. So with that, we want to thank you for your attendance this afternoon. Appreciate your time being with us. Thanks to all the presenters. You guys uh, all did a great job. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll close it up for here. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.